co-led team integration station with my friend and fellow UW PhD student, Shashank Bhushan. Each member of our team thought a lot about what we wanna get out of this week, which is just like a deluge of information. And what I think really brought us together was a desire to dive into this amazing resource and lay down the groundwork for continued engagement after the hack weekends. So rather than going deep into a specific data set or question, we focused more on developing frameworks and test cases to explore some of the tools and data sets that so many people have worked so hard on creating. And Shashank, do you wanna say a word? Let's begin. All right, um, so the first thing that we that we wanted to think about at Integration Station was what's gonna happen one month and one day from now when we don't have access to the Jupyter Hub environment anymore and we're, we're all working locally on our local machines. So one of the things that we did was we just wanted to create a more seamless process for getting started with locally with Conda and also getting started locally with PIP. And we created a series of Jupyter Notebooks that allow us to step through each part of that and access the um, environment file that, that was used in the Docker image um, that, that created the Jupyter Hub environment for all of us. So we, we have a couple of notebooks for that. And then, uh, next slide, slide please. And then we wanted to then make it even just seamless to move from setting up that environment into working programmatically um, for with the Snowdep data using NSIDC. This is a total hack from Megan's slide, but we wanted to hack it in a way that made it easier for us to do this with the Snowdep data, with the Snow Pit data, and also this Snowux SQL data set. So we have a series of different notebooks that do that. And um, I think Gipti is gonna be next. Next please. Um, so basically we wanted to explore Snow because wanted to know more about the data and find out what we can be able to retrieve from that data. So one of the things we also look at working outside from the machine, which is not online, like um, Ryan said. So um, one way was to be able to um, subset the data and apply it to other data sources, which might not be, uh, which might not be loaded. So basically the first thing we did that was to just create um, a bounding geometry from unique queries in the, in the site where maybe you want to look at a particular page for a particular day, we went ahead and did that. And then we subset, we create a shape file out of that we'll be able to use to select data that we want to look at. And through other functions, you can be able to just compare areas which are similar in terms of the measurements of microscope or GPR and then explore what you are able to achieve from that. And finally, we are taking a step to look at ISO data and how we can be able to use the data derived from the queries and um, geodatabases to be able to explore more um, Next slide, please. So something that I was interested in was to use the slide rule and compare it with the uh, traditional products that we download from NSIDC. Um, I was not able to compare exactly, I know, uh, but I, I wanted to explore the way slide rule could be used. Also, I was new to ICE PYX, so I was kind of, uh, working with that and playing around with that to see how it works. And I think the uh, next session would uh, be better to help. Uh, and we're going to talk about a bit even after this to see how we can compare the two data sets. So then we did, uh, among all these things, we did a quick comparison or not even a comparison, but a basic plot of how things look like. So on the left, we have a uh, uh, 3DEP LiDAR DEM uh, uh, on which we have one of the ISAT2 tracks plotted. Uh, this ISAT2 track is from July 2020. Uh, so we can expect that uh, no snow is there and we can compare it with the snow of LiDAR track. On the right, we see a messy plot with a lot of points. Uh, the black points are the uh, ATLO3 point clouds uh, uh, along this track. Uh, the uh, red uh, points uh, is the LiDAR point cloud, uh, which we can consider as a ground truth to measure at least. 
the green uh, point which are very less uh, visible here are the ATLO8 points and the uh, colored points are the slide rule return points uh, which are colored based on the number of photons which were used in calculating that particular segment. What we see is that the ATLO8 points closely follows the LIDAR uh, 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 point cloud and uh, so does the uh, slide rule point cloud. Uh, I, uh, we do not do the in-depth uh, zoomed in analysis here, but uh, we highlight that some of the slide rule uh, returns are way off than the LIDAR and the ATLO8 returns, uh, which we need to investigate into and stay tuned to Slack for uh, more updates as we get more deep into the data. Thank you. And I think uh, Seth is gonna share his screen for this section, great. Yeah, can everyone see my screen? Um, so a few of us were uh, really interested in building off the great tutorials from David and Scott and Claire, the uh, raster and LIDAR processing to see if we could um, take a look at some of the SnowX um, snow depth data and compare it to um, the ASO uh, DEMs and possibly bring in some of our own processing uh, methods and see how far we get. So uh, this was a really good opportunity to learn to interact with the SnowX database and and get everyone up to speed with uh, all these great libraries like uh, Rio X-Array for dealing with raster data. Um, so yeah, we didn't get quite all the way to dealing with some of the nuts and bolts of co-registration of uh, different DEMs, but that's something we're going to be able to build on. So, um, yeah, we got through some, got to use all these great libraries, and it's uh, such a great knowledge base. And SnowX on the website to just search for a library and find great uh, tutorials and examples of how to use them. So, we built off of um, we had a couple DMs that weren't in the SnowX database, these ASO uh, products. And so we just download those separately and um, load them in with Rio X-Ray. Um, and we also did a little bit of processing there to project them into the same coordinate system as, as the SnowX uh, database. Um, so that was pretty fun to to see how easy it is once you load things into um, these great Python libraries to just convert, um, reproject. And um, the other thing we wanted to do, we built off of uh, Micah's super helpful database tutorial to figure out how to take tiles out of the Snow database, but but we didn't want to get one tile at a time. We wanted the whole um, raster or a specific region. So it was really neat to be able to build up a query. Um, let's see, got functionality here to build up a query and basically pull out a big geotiff and get the, the spatial database to do the work for us. Um, getting those tiles merged and resampled and everything. So um, let's see what yeah, so we wanted to take a, a couple things, um, just comparing the snow on and snow off um, DMs that we we pulled out, and then also um, bring in the three depth tiles with the same function as as before, bringing out the ASO snow depth product and the three depth tiles from the database with this this cool function. Um, so I'll, I'll bring in uh, Shad here to talk a little bit more about how, uh, like where we, where we would go with this now that we've got these rasters and we have some tricky issues to, you know, figure out, are they using all the same um, 
datum? Do we have some vertical issues? Do we need to account for differences in, in processing and compare um, to do a good analysis of, of these different snow depth products and, and maybe generate our own? Yeah, I think it was pretty, one of the things that we really wanted to do was kind of validate the ASO snow depth product because it's um, sometimes challenging to figure out exactly what's going on behind that hood. And impressively, the there was a small, what, like a 10 centimeter bias between what we got and what they published, which was pretty good. Um, but, you know, we were pretty impressed with that. Um, for me, not having a background in this kind of computing, it was great to be able to get this far up to speed this quickly. And then we, the last plot that Seth showed was the difference between the two snow-free DEMs that we had access to, the 3 dep DEM, MASO, snow-off DEM. And you can see there's a datum issue that, that we haven't had time to, to exactly resolve, but there's still quite a bit of variability between those two um, snow off DEMs that's pretty interesting. Pro probably a lot of it's over steeper slopes where we didn't um, do any sort of co-registration between the, the two DEMs. Um, but I think with a little bit more tinkering around, this would be a great, the next step would be to start to bring in the snow pit data and GPR data and think about um, how those point data fit into the, you know, the the snow surfaces that you could get over the entire Mesa. So that's, that's kind of where we got to. Awesome, thanks, Chad. And we've got one last, one last subgroup that would like to chat with you. Uh, yeah, so the last subgroup, um, we were focusing more on just trying to take satellite data, specifically data from ISAT-2 and another satellite known as Cryosat-2 and try to just get it into a data format that would make it more easily uh, comparable to some of the other SNOWX data. Because um, So basically, we're just trying to convert it to something like X-arrays or to GeoPandas data frames or dictionaries, uh, since a lot of SNOWX data seems to be in those formats. And so in doing so, we would hopefully be able to easily generate like say elevation difference maps or some other, some other types of variable data. Um, just as a quick crash course for Cryosat 2, because uh, I don't believe that was mentioned much during this week, uh, Cryosat 2 is um, a satellite that is radar based. And as the name suggests, it's mostly focused on getting surface elevation measurements over like glaciers, ice sheets, and sea ice. Um, but we did notice that it has some overpasses in the mid latitudes, including Grand Mesa. And so we just wanted to try and uh, work with the data a little bit just to see what we could get over Grand Mesa. It is a little temporally coarse. Uh, Cryosat 2 only has a revisit time of about once a year, which means it only goes over the same spot uh, like once every year or so. Um, but we still just wanted to see what we could get out of that data and see if we could actually compare it with say a DEM. Um, just to start off first though, uh, looking at the ISAP2 data, um, we used a mix of ice picks and a slide rule to convert, to first convert uh, the data into a GeoPandas data frame. And then we also found out that we could convert uh, the ISAP2 data into um, an X-ray. And in doing so, we were able to essentially put an overlay, like set an ISAT2 track as an overlay, as so shown in the bottom left figure. Um, that ISAT2 track is over an ESRI image, and it's color coded with respect to surface elevation. So something that could theoretically be done is instead of just doing a single track, you could do multiple tracks, then maybe instead of surface elevation, you could do like difference with a DEM or possibly even snow depth just to try and improve, just to get like a good map of ISAP2 surface elevation, snow depth, or DEM difference over the Grand Mesa area. Um, and then something else we did was just try to compare it with the ASO DEM, um, which is what this uh, bottom middle figure here shows. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of yellow in there. Um, but that mostly just goes to show that the that both the ISAT2 data and the ASOD um, do show some pretty good agreements over the over the area. And we were also able to plot both of those at the same time, which was also very useful to have. And then just, just to go over the Cryosat 2 data, uh, this figure on the right, um, the, the faded mosaic over the Sentinel image is, uh, is a DEM just showing some surface elevation data. And then it also has a bunch of has a bunch of lines and dots that refer to some of the Cryosat 2 data that was retrieved over the area. Again, there's some pretty good agreements. It might be a little hard to see just from just from this, but we did. But when we did do a 2D plot, we were able to see that there was good agreement between Cryosat 2, the DEM, and ISAT 2. So it might be interesting to try and look at that more carefully just to see how well they actually agree with each other. Um, so yeah, that was mostly what we worked on. Um, we did get we did learn a lot about how to actually process this data. Um, I actually have to give a big virtual high five to Max and Tree just working with the Cryosat data because <clears throat> just because it was pretty tricky to work with just from what I saw. But yeah, I think that mostly covers what we what we worked on. Great. And that's all we have. Thank you.